everyone. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Welcome to this multicultural committee event, Kids and Cops, Youth and Police Relations. Um, before we get started, I want to remind you that this is uh, sponsored by the Multicultural Committee, and we have several other events uh, going on this semester. Our calendar is online, um, uh, but our very next event after this is uh, Japanese uh, Americans in World War II, uh, and that's on November 19th and November 20th. So keep in, you know, keep your eyes out for our announcement, reminding you, and hopefully some of you will show up for that too. Um, before um, the other announcement I want to make is, if you need to leave early for some reason, please do so quietly. There are doors in the back uh, because the presentation will still be going on, and we don't want to uh, disturb. Uh, with the listeners or the speaker. Um, and finally, you have the evaluation forms there. So if you could take a moment at the end to fill that out and hand that in to me before you leave, that will help us. It's, your feedback is really important in uh, bringing other quality events like this to the campus. Okay, um, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Lisa Thoreau is the founder and executive director of Strategies for Youth. Strategies for Youth is a nonprofit advocacy and training organization dedicated to improving police and youth interactions. Uh, Lisa built Strategies for Youth in 2009 from the ground up without formal institutional or foundational support. Before her work with Strategies for Youth, Lisa served as policy specialist and then as managing director of the Juvenile Justice Center of Suffolk Law School. She has trained police in the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority, Everett and Cambridge Police Departments, as well as police uh, across the country. Her assessment and training of 235 officers in the Cambridge Police Department led to a reorganization of the way that department provides service to the youth. So please welcome Lisa Farrell. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to speak with students. Um, I usually speak with police and they're very hostile, so I hope you won't be hostile, will you? No? Okay. I'll find out. So, uh, as you know, my name's Lisa, and, and um, I hope we can have a conversation this morning about police youth relations and the issue of disproportionate minority contact, which is something we're going to talk about in great detail. I'm going to show you a movie, too, about it, but before I do that, um, I'm wondering how many of you live in Fall River? Okay, and how many of you um, live in New Bedford? Okay, have any of you ever been stopped by the police when you're under the age of 17? None of you. None of you willing, to, you have. And how did that go? Can you, would you be willing to share what happened? Uh huh. In between classes, we had double sessions of football. I had gone home and come back. I guess there was something going on with another school team playing. There was a school bus. The school bus had pulled over to the side. I had passed the school bus. And while I was at the light, I did notice that the stop sign was out. The police officer stopped me afterwards and basically gave me a ticket for passing the school bus. And how were you treated by the officer? Uh, at, that, at that time, that officer was, he was a little cocky. You know, this wasn't, you know, I, I, didn't, I know it was just because I was probably a young kid. Mm -hmm. But that was the only time. Uh, any other time I've been pulled over, it was always good. It's always been respectful yeah. and good. OK, how about others? Anyone else been stopped? No, great. I'm glad to hear none of you have been stopped. So. Um, what we want to talk about today is uh, police youth interactions and um, those that are initiated by police and sometimes not by police. So um, I want to ask you, what's your theory of juvenile delinquency? Is anyone taking a criminology class or anything having to do with juvenile justice or criminal justice? No? 
Why are, why did you, yes, ma'am, why did juveniles get in trouble? Sorry. Um, I feel that juveniles um, within a certain age group um, should have the opportunity to be rehabilitated versus um, getting treated as an adult. There's a lot of children, juveniles, in our society today that are exposed to situations that will lead them to, you know, commit criminal does anyone, what's your name? D. Does anyone agree with D? How many of you here agree with uh, Florida, which says you can start transferring a child at the age of 12 to adult court, adult jail, adult prison? Who here agrees with that? You do? Oh my gosh, why? Why? Yeah. Because some, at that age they know right from wrong. Oh really? Yes. How do you know that? Because I have two teenagers and they know right from wrong. And uh -huh. I see. I understand some children come from a bad background and have single parents, but it's all how you're raised. And what happens to them when they go to adult jail and adult court? You do the crime to pay the time. And, and how do you want them coming out when they've paid the time? You know, depending on what the crime was, goes with the time. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't, I mean, if you kill somebody for no reason, then you should do the time. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how I feel. Anyone disagree? Yeah. Okay, but let's get back to the theory of juvenile crime. You're, that's one theory of why they come out much worse and why they recidivate three times faster when they've been placed in adult jails and adult prisons. And they recidivate, meaning they recommit and reoffend much more violently. Anyone have a theory of what causes juveniles to engage in delinquency in Massachusetts? And at what age are you no longer a delinquent in Massachusetts as of this year? 18. The law just changed, so in 2014, you'll be treated as a juvenile till the time you are 18, and then you go to automatically to adult court. Right now, the only time you automatically go to adult court in Massachusetts is when? Anyone know? Yeah. When you commit like murder or you know a crime, um, a felony basically. No, only murder. Only murder. Only murder. You get transferred immediately to superior court, and you have to be 14. How many youth are committing murders annually in Massachusetts? Anyone know? How, how about you? How many would you guess? What's your name? My name is Maggie. Maggie, how many do you think are committing murder each year in Massachusetts? We have 800,000 youth. I don't know. 100. 100? How about you, sir? Uh, 200. 200? <laughs> Dee, what would you say? I would say a lot of them. Okay, so there are about 13,000 juveniles charged and brought into court annually in Massachusetts, and about two, not 2%, two percent, two or three are char charged with murder or manslaughter annually. Okay, it's ex extremely exceptional. The vast, Gesundheit, the vast majority of juveniles are charged with disorderly conduct, um, disturbing a school and assembly. That's about 40% of the caseload nationally. And we don't know in Massachusetts because the state won't collect data. But nationally, um, the vast majority of youth are charged 80% for nonviolent offenses. So part of what I want to do today is make sure you know what the facts are about juvenile delinquency so we can think about how that system works and, and who it has in its craw and clutches. So here's some of the theories whoops, about juvenile justice and crime. One is that kids at risk are more likely to commit juvenile offenses. And um, some of the things we think are risk factors are community disorder, cognitive defects, in other words, a child who's developmentally delayed or has many learning disabilities, um, poverty, school failure, family violence, some mental illnesses, um, greed, there, let's not forget greed, unemployment, substance abuse, poor nutrition, hopelessness, lack of empathy, and poor decision making. Now, there's someone in this room who has experienced every one of these things in one person's life and has not become a juvenile delinquent, right? 
and we don't always understand what it is that makes some young people be charged as delinquents. But how do we measure crime and delinquency in America? What's the number one way we measure it? How would we know if there's crime? Our single measure is arrests, right? And we say, oh, violent crime is up or down by, by the number of arrests. So what I want to suggest to you, whoops, why do I keep doing that? Sorry. Is um, it's hard to know exactly what the crime rate is or what the delinquency rate of offending is if we have this one measure. And we're going to go into why that's difficult to know. There's some protective factors that we know reduce the likelihood that a juvenile will get involved in offending. And those are family support, school success, good housing, stable employment, even after school or the parents have stable employment, good health, positive friends. They come from an ethical framework. They're independent, have self-efficacy. They have a lot of adult guidance and community respect, physical safety. They have a good future in mind. I know some people who have all of this and have also engaged in delinquency. You, sir, are nodding. Do you know someone like that? Do you know someone from both sides? Uh, I'm from the left side. Yeah. And I was crime. Yeah. The thing that, that kept me out of it was mainly perceptions of future aspirations, community respect, um, school success, and that was it. But those are huge. Those are huge. Having hope and school <clears throat> success and feeling competent, those are very huge things for young people. Anyone here want to be a police officer or work with young people or work like at DYS, the Department of Youth Services? Anyone want to be a social worker, any of those? Great. Well, you'll see that the role of hope is so key in any positive decision making. Um, you'll see that that's very key. And then competence is another major source of that. So it's very hard for us to know what exactly explains delinquency or offending or what can prevent it. Um, we do know that kids on the, on the side, the protective side, are much less likely to engage in use of uh, weapons. May not be less likely to engage in use of uh, what we call casual drinking or casual pot use. Um, or my, uh, but we know they're much less likely to be involved in violence. Um, so um, keep that in mind. Now, there's another factor that we have to recognize that affects uh, not only how crime is measured, but who is considered criminal. And I want to show you this video. Everybody here watch uh, What Would You Do? That television program? OK, so you get a treat. You can look this up online and find many of these. I am addicted, so I hope you will enjoy this too. This is about a 13-minute film. An expanded camera of ethics, a sort of lab experiment that can have unexpected results. Here's John Quinones. Can you all see it all right, or should I turn off the light? A friend of the man arrives and makes the call to 911. And the cops will take care of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a nice facility for you guys. Yeah. 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 But the police are not coming. And these teenage vandals are not going to jail. They're actors. The car and the hidden cameras belong to us. We wanted to know if anyone would step in and try to stop a blatant act of vandalism in a suburban parking lot. But as you'll see, before our experiment is over, we'll get a lesson in human nature we could never have predicted. Our teenage vandals are loud and pretty brazen in broad daylight, yet people continue to walk right by. Do they think the boys are trashing their own car? Well, even when it becomes clear the car is not the boys, many keep right on going. Yeah, I'm spray painting my own car. <laughs> you being sarcastic? Yeah. This woman seems to be almost joking with the boys. Almost. Don't do mine, please. I can't do it. <laughs> please, don't do mine. Uh, I 
promise I won't do yours. The women keep on walking. Later they told us they would have called the police. And how about this woman? Will she step up? She looks concerned. She's soon joined by another woman. They stop, speak, but keep going. She says getting involved isn't worth the aggravation. I have to say, there's times where I have been a witness to things and I've had to take off work and go to court. I was horrified, but we did keep walking. I should have done something. This woman keeps an eye on the scene from a safe distance, but we'll come back to her later. Our vandals, meanwhile, have been at it for nearly three hours, destroying that car and seldom being challenged. But they'll soon meet their match. This man, sprinting up the path, Demand some answers. Is it yours? Is it yours? Well, so why don't you mind your own business? Is this is public business. Public business? Yeah, public business. If you take somebody's vehicle to buy their property, it's public. Let me show you how much I can't say. I don't know. I can't understand. The boys, meanwhile, are undaunted. <laughs> We're with ABC News. When we introduce ourselves to Brian Jakes, he's still pretty steam at the boys and at us. While he calms down, we talk to his wife, Dawn, who had walked by the boys earlier. I was keeping an eye on him. I was waiting for my husband to come back because I wasn't going to confront three boys by myself. Brian has cooled off now, and he says he was just acting on a lesson his father taught him. You can't turn a blind eye or deaf ear if somebody's in trouble. It wasn't your property. No, you're right, it wasn't. But, you know, it was somebody's. You know what? We're all in this together. He took action in a way that was selfless, and it was about stopping something bad from happening. Jack DeVidio, professor of psychology at Yale University. He made a difference. I don't think it was a smart thing to do, necessarily, but I think it was a good thing and the right thing to do. Dangerous? Dangerous. That's why most people will walk by. Indeed, our vandals have been added for most of the morning, viciously destroying someone else's car. Dozens of people have walked by, yet only a handful have challenged them. But we're about to discover that if this kind of vandalism in broad daylight doesn't get much attention, something else does, something we could have never imagined. Remember, all that destruction by our vandals triggered just one 911 call. But it turns out two other calls were made to 911 from the same park. Where's the But those calls were about another car parked nearby. A couple guys in the car laying down like they look like they were getting ready to uh, rob somebody. Rob somebody? How does he know that? The caller hangs up, but a few moments later, he's back. Okay, guys, we're really back in the in the car, and that's why we're going to get some fun. In fact, the young people in the car are just sleeping. They also just happen to be black. Whether well, it's because of the media, because of history, we as Americans have an association of blacks with crime. Both blacks and whites have that association of blacks with crime. It doesn't make sense. You call the cops on sleeping kids and not the vandals. There's nothing rational. But if we have the associations of blacks with crime, we see what we expect, and even if they're sleeping, we can make that into a potential criminal act. If that had been white kids sleeping. Then they'd be white kids sleeping. But coming up, if a few African Americans resting in a car trigger calls to 911, what will happen when we replace the white vandals with three black actors? Will that make a difference? When What Would You Do comes back. To find out how people react to a blatant act of vandalism, we sent white teenagers, actors hired by us, to trash a car in broad daylight. And then we watched as dozens of people walked right by. As it turned out, there was just one call to 911. But at the same time, from the same park, 911 
911 operators got two other emergency calls. And to our astonishment, those calls were not about our vandals, but about the young people in this car. A couple guys in the car laying down like they look like they were getting ready to uh, rob somebody. The people in the car were African American, and they were just sleeping. We know because we invited them here. They're friends and relatives of another set of actors hired by us for the second part of our experiment. What will happen if we change the race of those vandals? And if this group could trigger 911 calls just by dozing in their car, what will happen when we send these black teenagers out to do some real damage? As she walks by the vandals, this woman is already on her cell phone. Yeah, I'm with the son, and uh, I saw the walking path with a group of one, two, three, kids. And right on her heels, this man, cell phone in hand. 911, where is your emergency? Yeah, hi, I'm over in Ridgewood at the uh, Shaw River Park on Ridgewood Avenue. Okay, people spray paint your car? Yeah. Alright, you got it ready. We'll send it off. This woman asks the boys what they're up to. Uh, yeah, I don't know, we ain't doing nothing here. Just having fun, man. While maintaining a safe distance, she also calls 911. Good. This is for up on a car. Okay. Thank you. Black and white. Uh, they both, they all three look like they're just black. <laughs> black nails. Yep. Just black. Like the ones that were like, not happy? The police will be here. Huh? The police are coming. All three were angered by the vandalism, but wary of confrontation. Teenagers are kind of unpredictable. They seemed like they weren't afraid of being caught. I wasn't going to go especially right up to them because I had tools. Um, that could be used against me, and there's three of them and one of me. The destruction continues, and it's clear that in this predominantly white suburb, our three African-American vandals are generating more interventions and more calls to 911 than the white vandals. They was pulling out the cell phones. Just one lady almost tripped, calling like, uh, they're like, they're here. They're here. Hey, is that your car? No. Is it yours? No, we shouldn't be doing that. I felt outraged. How dare you come to our backyard and do something like that in the middle of the day in front of our kids? I don't care where you're from. I don't care what color you are. You do something in the And so immediately, I, I, I decided to call the police. Ridgewood Police, can I help you? Yes, hi. Uh, um, there's actually three kids in the park. And uh, they're vandalizing a car. They're actually painting the car and they're trying to break in the door right now. My husband was right to say that what if those kids had a gun? And at that moment, honestly, I didn't think about that. The way I am, if I see something, I do something right away. What I found fascinating is that she defined that situation as her backyard. Suddenly it becomes us against them. It was clear then that these people are outsiders and they don't, they don't belong here. They don't belong here doing the things that they're doing. This is not your car? No. You have to stop. Why? It's illegal. Okay. Yeah, somebody's going to call the cops. This conversation lasts four minutes, and this woman even gives the boys her name. What's your name? Kim? Which they promptly paint on the car. Now they said that you did it. I mean, now we're going to call the cops on you. <laughs> so what difference did it make when we changed the vandals' rates? A total of 10 calls to 911, compared to one call when the vandals were white, and more people stepped in. They probably recognize that there's vandalism going on more because these, these kids are black, because of the associations, the expectations, the stereotypes they have, and the fact that these kids are from a different neighborhood. By intervening or calling 911 on the black vandals, people are doing the right thing. But the white vandals, more likely to get a pass. Obviously what you guys were doing was wrong and what the white kids were doing was wrong. But the reaction is not the same. That's not the same. You know, they say, you know, treat people equally, but you know, as, as you see, you know, it's, it's it still, still it. going on, you know. There's, there's many different types of racism. We asked those who intervened, would you have acted any differently if the boys had been white? I think I would have done the same there. Maybe I would have stopped them sooner. I did notice there were African-American young boys who were in a white neighborhood, but if they had been white kids, I mean, we would have done exactly the same. I might have done it quicker. I probably hesitated because they were black. I don't like to 
assume that three black kids are up to trouble. But the response to their vandalism isn't what these young men will remember most about this experience. They'll remember that while the white actors were busy laying waste to that car, there were two 911 calls reporting suspicious African Americans asleep in their car. The people in that car were actor Justin Chandler's family. These kids are destroying this car and trying to break in. They're not even worried about they, it. Meanwhile, they weren't about Justin's family. Over sleeping. There. Sleeping, sleeping in, in the car. Being black. What's wrong? Well, I mean, here we are breaking into a car, and they are sleeping, you know? I was, I actually wasn't even shocked how she sort of was offended. Tells me that there's still racism out here, and people are frightened by people color their skin. Your message to folks? It would be a better world if we could stop racism. I don't know if that's going to happen because it's such a big world, but you can help to stop. It's always someone that you Maybe know. this will help. Yeah, this will help. Maybe this could help. But maybe this will make a difference. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. hopefully. Yeah. Good guys. So I'm showing you that because today we're going to talk about something called disproportionate minority contact. And um, we're all against crime, right? But it depends who does it when we decide to intervene, right? Both groups of boys were causing the same level of harm. Am I right? And um, while this is a white suburb, there's a significant number of African Americans living there. So it was very interesting to hear that woman say, you come here as opposed to you live here and you're doing this. She just assumed the white boys were from Ridgewood, New Jersey. Anyone been to Ridgewood, New Jersey? No? Well, it's interesting because Ridgewood, New Jersey, I believe, is the same city where five athletes raped a mentally retarded girl in about 1993 and no one would come out against them. So what I'm trying to show you here is not just the police are necessarily the uh, purveyors of racism, but when police are called into situation reflects some of the general community's point of view about who is and who isn't guilty. And that's what we want to talk about a little bit today. So disproportionate minority confinement or contact is a major um, law that is routinely ignored. It's a federal law passed down in 1988. And it means that when the proportion of minority youth are involved in the juvenile justice system, in numbers that exceed their proportion in general population, there is disproportionate minority contact or confinement. So let's say I go to DYS. Massachusetts has about 28% of its total statewide youth population are youth of color. How many youth in the Department of Youth Services, which is where we incarcerate and detain youth, how many of them are youth of color? Is it going to be 28% like it is in the general population? Yes? No? What do you think? If I go to the Department of Youth Services where we incarcerate youth, and, and we know the general population of youth of color in Massachusetts is 28% of the total youth population. When I go to DYS, am I going to see 28% of the youth being youth of color? What am I going to see? I guess around 60%. Anyone else want to guess? How about you, sir? You want to guess? Yeah. Okay, anyone else? D? 28%, that's not very, I don't know. I was thinking two to three because of the low percentile. Uh huh, it's about 75%, okay? And so Massachusetts has been singled out as one of the worst states in the country for disproportionate minority contact. And we don't only have extreme disproportionality in juvenile delinquency, we're one of the few states in the country to have the most extreme difference between the rates of teen birth among Latina girls and white girls. So the teen birth rate among Latina girls is six times higher than it is for white girls. And it's not usually that much of a spread in other states. So look at some of this data here. The relative rate index, I'm sorry, this got thrown out of whack here. This, this line here is the relative rate index, the one on the right. And when we look at juvenile arrests per 1,000 persons, there are about 56 per 1,000, 49% are white, 101 
our, our, the rate is 101 are African American. And that shows you a two to one disparity in arrest rates. I don't have Latino data here because it hasn't been collected systematically, but hopefully the, the US will get on board with that. And you see these extreme differences very uh, much in the West. I just came back from Arizona and you see it big time. So then once the kid is arrested, how many of them are referred to juvenile um, um, uh, arrests of those? 88%, uh, 88 is the rate and about 98 still uh, about 1.2 relative rate uh, index difference there. Whether or not you're diverted becomes closer. So we're under 1.0. So if you know statistics, we're getting less of a disparity. But then our changes occur again when judges make the decision about who should be detained and who should be placed in care. So you see a system that's very pervaded by race as a determinant. And it starts off most extremely with arrest rates. So we look at the impacts of disproportionate minority confinement, and we see that about seven out of 10 youth are, are youth, I'm sorry, seven of the 10 youth referred to juvenile, I'm sorry, let me try that again. Seven of 10 youth who are referred to adult court and adult jail and adult prison are youth of color. Um, those who are given life without parole are 70% youth of color. And let's just talk about what happens when you do place a juvenile in an adult jail or adult prison. Um, youth are, who are less than 18, 18 years old are about 1% of all the prisoners in the US, but they're 36 times more likely to commit suicide um, and 18% of all inmate on inmate rapes. So much so that the American Correctional Association, which I wouldn't call liberal, would you? Good, they aren't said, do not place juveniles in our adult prisons. We cannot control the prisons when you put juveniles here. And when juveniles come out of prison or out of adult jail, they come out much the worse for wear. And they're much more likely to commit a new offense and more violently. Now let's think about why kids get detained. Let's, what's your name? Alex. Alex, I arrest you on a Saturday afternoon, on a Friday afternoon. You have just stolen um, an iPod and an iPad. How much is that worth if it's new? You've stolen it from, a, not from an Apple store, because I don't think you can steal anything from an Apple store, although I'd be impressed if someone could. But anyway, how much is an iPod and an, I'm sorry, an iPod, an iPhone, and an iPad? How much would that cost? OK, so we're over $250. $250 is petty larceny and under is petty larceny, over $250 is grand larceny. So now you're charged with grand larceny. This is a serious amount of stuff you've stolen, okay? I bring, you're arrested, I bring you into the department. Um, you come over to the detention center, I conduct a risk assessment in, in, uh, instrument with you and I look to see, well, you've got high risk, you're not in school, you're 15, you've dropped out, um, you have a prior for trespass, I'm guessing you don't have a good home life. Um, your need index is pretty high. You're not sure where you can find your mom. That suggests to me you don't have a lot of the protective factors I showed you before. So I decide that if I can't reach you, I'm going to hold you. If I, I'm sorry, if I can't reach your mom, I'm going to hold you. I call your mom. I call your mom. I call your mom. She doesn't answer. She doesn't answer. It's 4 o'clock. My shift is over. I can't reach your mom. I say, OK, you're going to stay in detention till Monday. Now, what if you had been put in an adult detention instead of a juvenile detention because you had committed grand larceny? You would be with who over the weekend, right? People who may have committed attempted rape, people who may have uh, done very violent crimes. And here you are, a 15-year-old juvenile with a nonviolent property crime being put in that same situation just because my probation officer couldn't reach you, your mom? Is this in anybody's interest? Well, increasingly, everyone's saying no. Increasingly, we're recognizing that putting juveniles in the same place as adults doesn't help juveniles. It exposes them to terrible things, including serious harm. So about 25 states across the United States now are rethinking the val validity of doing that. So let me ask you, if a system is this biased, is it legitimate? What do you think? I mean, 
mean, ethically it doesn't make sense, but, but legally, yeah, that's what we do. It, it works, it pass. Well, I'm not asking that. What's the difference between legal and legitimate? What's legal mean? You're just saying the system is legal and we've got to follow the system, right? Yeah. Whatever it does, right or wrong, if it puts juveniles with adults, if it arrests people who aren't uh, doing the wrong thing and arrests less of the people who are doing the wrong thing. I mean, how many bankers have been arrested? Anyone here know someone with a foreclosed <coughs> home? How many bankers have been arrested since that financial scandal? How many have been imprisoned? How long would you get for stealing $1,000 worth of uh, property, right? We treat people differently in this system, economically, racially. So legal would mean by the law, right? And legitimate would be morally and ethically, you said, right? So what we're, we're having right now in this country is an inconvenient truth that a lot of our systems may be legal, but they are not very ethical. They don't align with our sense of morality too well, okay? So because of that, when you start challenging a system because morally or ethically it doesn't align with what your principles are, you're going to have trouble, right? You're going to have people resisting it. So if we understand legal as permitted by law and legitimate as the rules, standards, and principles by which we live, was it unfair or fair, the treatment that the young African Americans got. Anyone here think it was fair? Why don't you think it's fair? Tell me, you sir with the black hat on. Uh, depends on what it is. Well tell me in that movie, just based on that movie, was it fair that the white boys, you being a white male, um, was it fair that they got a, a pass and the blacks didn't, even when they were sleeping? Mostly, but not completely. Uh huh. They're not really used to seeing black teenagers that, and due to the media and the way the media portrays everything, they automatically assume, like, hey, these kids are doing a crime. While half the people who walk by the white kids just probably assume that it's their car or somebody they know. So it doesn't matter what they're doing, it matters the assumptions the officer or the people bring to it and the the way the people bring those assumptions determines whether or not the officer becomes involved. Is that right? Is that how it happens? Is, are you explaining it to me or justifying it to me? It doesn't or it does? It does show. Yeah, okay. So let's be thinking again about how we measure crime and how little what the action is seems to matter in some situations. And let's also look, because we're always willing to complain uh, that police are racists, right? And to be sure, some are. So are some judges, so are some teachers, so are some probation officers. Uh, so are some of us in the community. Um, we have to also look at the role of the community bringing police into these situations. And, and that's why I thought it was very interesting at the end, the psychologist from Yale with his terrible Boston accent, did you hear that? You, you didn't have an R in the entire interview, um, was saying something about citizenship, right? Right? So Keep that in mind then when you think about how some young people act towards police because police complain about this. When sanctions are delivered fairly and proportionately, they reinforce the legitimacy of the law and can contribute to compliance and desistance. So let's break that down. So when we think we're going to be treated by the law, by law enforcement, we're more likely to comply and we're more likely to stop the bad things we're doing. That would be desistance. When they're unfair or disproportionate, 
as we just saw in this film, it leads to cynicism about the law and contribute to anger and persistence, meaning persistence in bad acts, okay? So you heard what the three African-American boys were saying at the end. It's racism. It still exists. Well, what's interesting about this is that when you see that kids do not perceive the system to be fair or legitimate, they don't invest in abiding by it as much, some of them. Okay, There's a whole wealth of new literature coming out, including um, thousands of young people being surveyed in Missouri, wherever that is. I think it's west, um, certainly west of Boston. Um, and there they looked at whether or not, when you do the stop and frisk kind of policing that we've seen in New York and that's been challenged in New York, has everyone heard about that lawsuit? No? no? Okay, you might want to look it up. Uh, the New York City Mayor Bloomberg uh, insistence on a stop and frisk approach to uh, African American youth and Latino youth has been challenged in court. And uh, they found that 94% of the youth stopped and frisked had nothing of contraband on them, no guns, no weapons, no drugs, nothing. Um, and 6% did, and those were charged, but over 4.6 million young people have been stop and frisked in the last 12 years. Over a billion has been sent in wrong, spent in wrongful lawsuits um, for misuse of force by the police, and yet everyone thought that was a good idea. Well, study after study shows that if a youth thinks that the system isn't fair, they don't see any incentive to abide by it. Does that make sense? You're nodding. You agree? Nope. How about you? What do you think? Uh, if, if the system is unfair, is there any point in trying to abide by it? No. Why? So you might as well have fun if you're going to get caught anyway, or if you're going to get charged for something maybe you didn't do anyway. Is that right? Well, that's how young people think. And some of you are not so far away from being under 25. Anyone here under 25? Guess what? Your brain stops growing at 25. So this kind of thinking is not only normal to your age group, but it's normal to a lot of adults, right? It's a lot of how our law legal system works and how a lot of us deal with this. But the problem is, when young people do not feel that police are legitimate or that they are over arresting youth of color, they don't think there's any reason to change their own behavior or what may have triggered the police to become involved with them. Instead, they focus only on the police behavior. So if the young person is doing something wrong, they're just like, no, no, it's just unfair. The system is unfair. So that doesn't help either. So you see the whole system being undermined. Is what I'm thinking making sense? Do you have any friends who've done anything like this? Anyone know anybody who's been arrested as a juvenile? Yeah? Well, actually, do you know anyone? Yeah. And how have they viewed the whole system? How did they describe the police and the judge? Did they say any of it was fair? Mm -hmm. What kind of things were they charged with? And have they changed as a result of that experience, do you think? No? Why not? I don't know. Can't explain it. Yeah. How, how about you, Maggie? I had a cousin who did 15 years in jail. He just got out about two years ago, and yes, he has changed. Uh-huh. From being in prison? Yeah. How old was he when he went? 19. 19. An adult. So you go to prison for that. Um, so the other thing about um, incentives to comply and cooperate are that they reduce um, and, and they uh, decline because young people can't predict whether or not they're going to be treated fairly and, and some of them just give up. Is this true of all young people of color? Is this true of all young people? No, right? Some of you would never, some of you may be of color and would never test the authority, would never test the limit. Am I right? And some will. And it's for those who do that we see um, an increasing view that the system isn't legitimate and a, a huge pushback. So let me ask you, if we have these conflicting and rather complicated things happening here, how do you fix it? I'm going to let you do the heavy listing here. How would you fix this? Yes, Dee. I feel that um, you know, everybody is quick to blame the high house 
like, you know, if you have a troubled teenager, right. oh, it's the home. Yeah, it, it, it could be the home, but if you have a society who is not willing to say, hey, you stop doing that, it's not going to stop. You have to break the cycle of violence, whether it's in your home, in your society, whatever the case, whether it's black or white. But D, B, it's too scary to do that. You thought no one would approach the, the boys. They were all too scared. It's too scary. Why should I have to go risk my life to stop someone from hurting someone else's property? Because if you are somebody who cares about your community and about the way the world is, is developing, you're going to do it. And I should risk my life for that? How many people risk their lives daily? Look at the people in Connecticut. Don't all those kids have guns? Well, how about someone else? Should I go risk my life? What do you think? Go ahead, you, sir. Please. Yeah. I grew up in New England, Connecticut, and I've been there for up to 50 years already. Someone got shot right across the street from me. I don't know who saw it, but literally everyone just did things to the police. Why? There's like five people across the street home. One person called the police saying they just heard a gunshot to the next, to the next house. They were watching the house. Everyone didn't say this for any. And even now, I look on YouTube and stuff. There was a thing on the news that someone said, why should we snitch? Why should we say this? There's nothing for me. Uh -huh. I, I'll get killed. I got family. I got people I care about. Why would I risk that? So it becomes okay if you don't snitch. It becomes okay if, if it's not stopped. You know, it'll continue. That's the problem. Like, yeah, you have family, you have friends, you have this. But if you don't stop it, your friends and your family are going to be at risk of this happening again, because now you've said it's okay to shoot somebody. What do you think, sir? Well, I think without, with, all in all, um, without community involvement, nothing will ever change, ever. So, but isn't um, this a job just for the police? What's that? Isn't this just a job for the police? No, absolutely not. You know, there has to be a, you know, they have, you have to have some sort of work in the society, you know. You have to look out for each other. There's not enough police out there that's going to help, and, you know, they're not everywhere. Um, just like in a scenario like that, you see somebody vandalizing, shouldn't matter what color they are, they're doing the wrong thing. Uh, the problem is, guaranteed half those people who didn't do anything would probably be upset to know that if something, someone did something to their car and somebody walked by, they'd be the first to judge. I couldn't agree more. So how do we fix that as a country? It's, it's hard. Right. You know, it's just, just you see it too much out there where you just walk by and don't say anything. You know, I, I see it all the time. Where where do you see it all the time? Oh, geez, uh, just going to the just going to the supermarket. Uh, you have a um, you have a child swearing or something in front of them while it's not doing anything, and everybody's just walking by, and it's like say something. You know, you don't have to like discipline the person, but say you know that's kind of not right. You're out in public. Yeah, but it's none of your business. How many people agree with that? It's none of your business what my child does. I'm just playing devil's advocate. I won't agree with anything any of you say, so don't worry about it, okay? It's none of your business what my child does. Yes, sir, how would you respond? I would say that's business. That's what you said to them? I mean, I wouldn't let my kid walk around swearing. But if you did, I mean, I, I got yelled at when my daughter was three. She liked to stay at the end of the, um, the grocery cart. And like this, like I think she was already practicing for um, the Titanic role. Anyway, um, a man came up to me and really, really yelled at me how was, I was endangering my child, right? He's doing the right thing by his sights. And I was like, she's, she, no, she isn't. I didn't like it. I could see his point and I didn't like it. I didn't say it's none of your business, but I didn't like it, right? And you said you wouldn't even put yourself in that position because you wouldn't let your child do that. But how, has anyone else been yelled at because of the way they handle their child in public? How, what happened, Dee? I have a six-year-old who's very vocal. Um, he says shit all the time, regardless of what, you know, doesn't even make sense. So we were at Walmart, and um, 
you know, he said shit to something, and uh, a lady came up to me, and you know, she really started yelling about it, and I, I didn't argue with her. She was absolutely right, because you know what? If somebody else's kid was walking by and he was swearing, and my kid didn't swear, I would have been. I would have said, "Hey, can you just watch the way your kid's talking?" Because I don't need my kid to walk around saying shit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I don't say it. Why should you know? When you're in public, it's a different. You know, you have to act in the best interest of everyone involved. If you're in your home, hey, whatever. Well, we can't act in the best interest of everyone involved because we're too scared, right? Right. Well, that's where all this crime. So. Are you, sir, in the green sweater, are you an immigrant to this country? No. Are you, sorry, I was hoping you were. Is anyone here an immigrant to this country? I was racially profiling. You are. Okay, I'm going to go after you because I talked Dee's ear off already. Mm -hmm. So, um, were you born here? No. Okay, so I don't know where you're from, but is it like this there? If um, a child misbehaves or someone does something wrong, does the community jump in? Okay. And we don't really care about it, but then if I grow up, me, I grew up in a traditional family. You have to be straight about everything. But for me, the other kids outside, it's different from me. Okay. And, and let's say something more serious, like destroying a car. Then what would you do? To be honest, I see it uh, different because if they put the, the same people that cross in there, that was, that, that's what the white people doing it, but then they put the same people crossing Yeah, but would your community jump in and say, stop that? Actually, they all would go and say, you're doing wrong. Uh -huh. They all just cross in to stay there quiet. Actually, they would go. They would go. Okay, and let's look about the, what was the woman who did speak to the African-American boys who might have been having guns? Um, what was she like? Anyone remember her? Yeah. And what did she look like? Asian. And was she 300 pounds and buff? Did she have a gun? Did they hurt her? Um, so it's just, it's worth considering why we are so scared. Why are we so scared? What do you think? Why are we so scared of talking to each other? Right. Well, I'll tell you something interesting. Between 1993 and 2002, a bunch of researchers looked at um, how juvenile crime was portrayed on television news. So they watched television news across the country. It's a report called Off Balance. And while juvenile crime went down 37% between 1993 and 2002, coverage of juvenile crime went up. How much do you think it went up? How about you, sir, sitting next to the fellow with the black hat? So juvenile crime went down. How much did coverage go up? Juvenile crime went down. Juvenile crime went down 37%. Now it's at its lowest ever since it was began to be counted in 1974. How much did television coverage of juveniles committing crime go up? 37%? Okay, and when else want to guess? You, sir? You want to guess how much uh, media coverage went up? Probably 100%. 100? And how about you in front of him? 474%. So here's the deal. Kids become scared of each other, okay? Adults become scared of young people, and it's reinforced and reinforced. Judges are scared of these young people. Prosecutors are. Oddly enough, defense attorneys and social workers aren't, but just about everybody else is. And so you see how this perpetrates. If I were to say to you, Stephen King is a criminal because of how he has poisoned the American consciousness and created so much fear, would anyone here agree with me besides D? No? You like him too much? Okay. So let's talk about some approaches to consider about how we can change what's happening right now. Let's talk about leadership. What leaders in Massachusetts are talking about these issues today? Who's talking about disproportionate minority 
confinement and contact to Massachusetts today? The governor? News to me. News to me. I don't know anyone talking about it. Yeah. I think it would be more like, like the city council. <coughs> News to me. Okay. News to me. Anyone in New Fall River, New Bedford talking about it? No. Well, at the national level, we're going to see someone who is. The other way to do it is to change the law. And I'm going to talk about some legal efforts to try and reduce disproportionate minority contact at the federal level and in Massachusetts. The other way is training, which is what we do at Strategies for Youth. And finally, community action, which all of you have mentioned. Community action is key here. The police are supposed to reflect the will of the people. The will of the people isn't always so healthy, right? Um, and that's why we want police to be professional. But if we don't partner with police, if we always say, let the police do it, let the police do it, we've let go of the control of our communities, which isn't good either. So I don't know why this is doing that. There we go. Here's Anyone know who that is? <coughs> well, you should because it says on top. Eric Holder. He said, black male offenders are sentenced to 20% longer than white offenders for similar crimes. This is true um, in so many cases with juveniles. He said, this is not just unacceptable, it's shameful. It's a speech he made in August of this year at the American Bar Association. He made a very important speech. I suggest you look it up if you want to read it in its entirety. It's a powerful speech. And he talked about how, unless we do something with this broken system, um, we will just continue to put away people who don't belong there, let others not be put there, and maintain a system that's profoundly broken and essentially quite racist. So he also points out that, um, and I, I don't know if you know this, we are 5% of the um, world's population, right? The United States, we have 360 million. What percentage are we of the incarcerated population? How much internationally? What proportion of the internationally incarcerated population belongs to the US? 5%, yep. 25%. And one out of every 100 men will be going to prison sometime in their life. One out of every three people under the age of 23 will be going to uh, arrest and detention and jail or prison. Um, I was trying to get some of his other facts, which I wanted to share with you. Well, in any event, you want to know, you want to read this speech because this is the first time at the federal level since someone like JFK, there's been an open, blatant, explicit recognition that race is troubling our systems and that we are over incarcerating everybody, white men, black men, white women, black women, Latino women. Um, this has increased profoundly. So here is the, the statute I wanted you to know. Um, the American population grew from 1980 to 2010 about 30%. It was an, a huge increase. How much did the jail or incarcerated population grow? Anyone want to guess? 800%. Okay, and what was the number one reason for that? What war? War on drugs. And it became a war on race. So. so we need leadership. We need people saying this. We need people like the American Bar Association and the judges and everyone else to be aware of this. And there are huge efforts going on. We're part of that. Um, I know Professor Gilbarb is part of many of those. If you're interested, come speak to me. I can help hook you up to efforts locally and, and nationally. But there are also some laws that have been enacted. So in 1974, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act was passed. And it gave out formula grants, and everything that has money means that it's likely to get implemented. And by 1988, they said, we're going to give you money if you, as a state of Massachusetts, for instance, make an effort to reduce disproportionate minority contact and confinement. And so Massachusetts ignored them. But other states said, you know what, we have so many kids of color in our detention facilities and incarceration facilities. We're going to try and reduce that with the money given by the feds. Well, in 1992, the Fed said, you can't just think about confinement. You have to think about the point of contact with police. But at the same time, in 1992 to 2010, 
Congress reduced the amount of money to make any of those changes 80 percent. So we saw no changes and we saw most states saying, well, if we don't have any federal money, we're not going to invest any of our state money to try and fix it. And so they don't. So um, you're seeing that these laws exist, but in the absence of sufficient leadership at the state level, nothing's happening. And one of the most exciting I, things I'm seeing in places like Milwaukee and Sacramento and Los Angeles and uh, places like um, Indianapolis is I'm seeing police chiefs saying, no, this is not good enough. This is not good enough. We have to do more to change the situation. I'm not always hearing the judges saying that, although in Indianapolis I am. I'm not always hearing uh, other cities or other positions like probation saying that, but they're being forced into it in some places by one person taking leadership. So these are some of the obligations. And places like Massachusetts until recently wouldn't even acknowledge that it had a disproportionate minority contact issue. And no one in Massachusetts is required to collect data. There's no state law requiring data collection. So the state doesn't even know what's going on. And, and of course, they didn't develop interventions. So the other thing I told you about is training and recognizing your own bias. Every single person here is racist. You tell me, my, I come from an immigrant family myself, and my mother will go through every country in Europe and tell me what she thinks about them, and none of it is good, okay? Hungarians are crazy, Romanians are liars, Germans are killers, uh, the French are impatient and smelly, right? She has something for every group, believe me, I heard it growing up. So it's not just black and white, it's white and white, it's ethnic groups, right? Am I right that Dominicans are hated in, in New York City more than any other ethnic group, more than Puerto Ricans? Yes, do I know why? I haven't a clue, I haven't a clue. When I go to Chelsea, Nicaraguans are liked, Salvadorans are liked, but Dominicans are hated there too. Do I know why? No, does it matter? Not to me, not to people outside the group, but even within groups that we see as one group, there's usually some kind of bias or prejudice or dislike. So we want to know why that matters. Does it matter in the actions you take towards them or that they take towards you? And if so, being conscious of that is key to changing what actions. And that means judges have to think, well, you know, if I see a kid from a Latino family, a single mom, I'm going to put that kid in foster care because I don't think that mom can handle it. But I see a white mom, single mom, I'm going to let her keep the child because she's more stable. And we see this throughout the child welfare system. I urge you all to go to this website, implicit.harvard.edu, and see just how biased you are. They have this cool way of doing it. They'll show you pictures and ask you to respond to them. And the speed at which you choose one or another characterization of the picture, like good or bad or wrong or right, will tell you something about your level of bias. So it can be towards uh, people who have Muslim or North African, I should say, North African characteristics, people who may be gay, people who are young, people who are white, people who are black, people who are Latino. How much do you trust them or not trust them? And the first step towards change in any kind of effective training is to start questioning how you think about it. So I highly recommend this test, and guess what? It's private. No one will know how you scored which is important, right? And then we have to use this research to educate ourselves. So now, for instance, judges in the child dependency context have to fill out a checklist and use that checklist as the guide as to whether or not they choose to place a child in foster care or not so they don't engage in racist stereotypes about which parent, as a function of race, is better able to take care of a child. We have to look at that research, and you should. There's a really interesting piece of research that just came out from UCLA in which a professor of psychology looked at how kids were looked at. So he said, at what age do you as a police officer, do you as a college student, because that's who he tested, start thinking that this kid should know better? And for white kids, the average age was, what age do you think? Between 10 and 18. At what age did the police and college students think that a, a white kid should know better? You said 12, right? What would the rest of you say? Who said 16? 12 or 13. 12 or 13? And at what age should a black kid know better? The same. The same, right? Uh-uh. So across the board, 
African American children were expected to know better as of eight years to 10 years old, and white youth were expected to know better as of 12 to 14 year old. And that's kind of what we just saw, right? We gave a pass to those white boys, they're just kids, they're just having fun. And the black kids should have known they don't belong here and you don't do that, get the hell out. Okay, so we have to use this research to think about our interactions with others. And we have to share that research and understand it and rethink how we are making decisions. Training is really important. We do something called training and developmental competence because we want people to understand that young people do things not always intentionally. This is our theory of developmental competence. You're welcome to have it. We want to see that the police and adults in a community use practices that promote relationships because if I respect you and I don't want to disappoint you, there's a good chance I'm not going to screw up as much. I didn't say not at all, not as much, right? And I'm wondering if some of the young people you knew and talked about before who weren't changed by the criminal justice system they engaged in really had no one who was in a relationship that tried to keep them on the straight and narrow, or did they? or connect to them. So that's something we, we promote with police. And then there are alternatives to arrest and incarceration. And some of them work better because what we're learning in psychology is that with youth, up to a certain point, um, incentives work much better than punishment. Or not one or the other. If you just use punishment, that doesn't trigger as much adherence to rules as incentives does. So the last one is community action. Um, and the fellow who was there for a while was so right when he says, the police cannot do this alone. It's not their job to do it alone, right? Is it their job to do it alone? Is it their job to take care of everything? When you said that no one would speak to the officer about the murder, how could the police do it alone without knowing, right? So not only do we want to understand that some cases stand for overall trends that are disconcerting, but we also want to know that what happens to one of us could happen to all of us, right? And so when something bad happens in the system to one of us, we all should be worried, like the Trayvon Martin case, right? We also have to not just sit there and say what you're doing is wrong. We have to propose alternatives. And one of the things we don't do very well in America is listen to young people. Young people have great ideas for alternatives, but we don't involve them and, and take them into account, which is a miss. Finally, um, we have to, as communities, usurp the role of the system. Now, I go to some cities where the police will get four or 500 calls from two blocks from people calling for service saying, there's a group of kids out there. And so they'll say, how come the police are on our streets all the time? Well, you keep calling them. So if you don't want to have that kind of clash in your community, you have to explicitly address it. Does that make sense? You hear what I mean? Okay, well, I'm glad there's certainty on that one. So those are some of the things that we have to do to understand how the system can be made better. And frankly, none of it can occur without our active involvement. And some of us will make our careers in that. Some of you may become police officers or social workers or neighbors who become actively involved in what's going on in their street. But active involvement is key to citizenship in America. It's uh, Legality is not morality. I think this is what you were saying before. Something may be legal, but it's not ethical. Legality is not morality, and sticking to the law is necessary for good citizenship, but not sufficient. Okay, and the other thing I would just leave you with is citizenship is a tough occupation, which obliges the citizen to make his own informed opinion and stand by it, and sometimes that's super hard. Ask me how I know. So, any questions? Nope. Yes? I just wanted to say, you know, we talk about what it means to be a good citizen in the situation. To me, knowing what's going on as far as governmental policy and elections, because elections oftentimes hit people against each other on very different approaches. You've got people that have a tough law and order approach there basically trying to increase penalties, increase incarceration, play on people's fears about crime, and then you have people that are trying to make smart um, changes in the way the war on drugs is being done. People need to follow that, get out and vote, and spread the word to other people about it. 
Um, I think that's part of what needs to happen. And instead, a lot of us feel like politics is irrelevant, and sometimes it's partly because they aren't addressing those issues, but oftentimes they do, and we need to be willing to, to weigh in on that. How many of you read the newspaper every day or look at it online? <coughs> Good for you. You're going to hopefully be less at the mercy of changing trends in America than not. Just know that two of the biggest states in the United States, New York and California, saw that the cost of detaining youth, which in New York was $223,000 a year, how many, and the, uh, it's certainly several of our incomes, right? Maybe all six of us here, or 20 of us here, right? Um, they said, this is not sustainable, plus these kids are coming out worse. So they just said, no, we're letting people out of prison. In California, they did that big time. New York, big time. They're placing young people close to their homes for community-based interventions. And guess what? What has happened to the crime rate? Did it go up? Went down. When they had to stop, stop and frisk until last week, did crime go up? Went down. So one of the key things here is remembering to have an informed opinion. That's why you must educate yourself, because some of the things we hold as true, that punishment works always, that it's the best response to behavior, isn't true. So thank you for listening. I hope you found this interesting. And if you want any information, you can look at our website, strategiesforyouth.org, or give me a call. Thank you.